Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Nuclear Criticality Safety Lecture Series. Today we're going to begin discussing statistical methods for estimating upper subcritical limits, where our goal is to estimate the 95-95 confidence interval for the highest credible eigenvalue and the lowest credible C over E. This 95-95 confidence interval again corresponds to the point where we have 95% confidence that 95% of the population lies above that certain point. We'll begin our dive into statistics by discussing normal distributions. Samples that are drawn independently with some random error will generally follow the shape of a normal distribution, where mu is the mean value for that distribution, and sigma is the standard deviation of that distribution. If we are to draw some random sample from a normal distribution, which we'll call x, then the z-score for x describes how likely or unlikely it is to sample some specific x, where z equals x minus the distribution's mean value, all divided by sigma. In other words, z describes how many standard deviations the randomly sampled x value is from the mean of the distribution. Since this well-known bell curve normal distribution is a probability distribution function, then the area under the curve of the normal distribution represents the probability that a random sample from that distribution will fall within that range. The probability of randomly drawing a point that is within one standard deviation of the mean of the distribution is about equal to 67%, while the probability of drawing a point that is more than one standard deviation from the mean is about 33%. Our goal in code validation is again to understand how uncertainty in nuclear data introduces uncertainty into a system's calculated eigenvalue. And while cross-section errors are not independent and may not follow a normal distribution, there are enough nuclear data parameters that it's reasonable to expect that uncertainty in cross-sections introduces an uncertainty in the system's eigenvalue that follows a normal distribution. Therefore, if our goal is to estimate the system's highest credible k effective or its lowest credible c over e, then it's reasonable to assume that these uncertain quantities will follow a normal distribution. So if we know the normal distribution that describes the likely distribution of these quantities, how do we estimate their highest and lowest credible values? Well, we can use a single-sided test to determine the probability that a randomly sampled point from a normal distribution will be above or possibly below some given value, which we'll call z0. This probability equals the area under the normal distribution's curve beyond z0, and it's also called the p-value for this statistical test. If we want to know the probability that a randomly drawn point will be above some z0, and if z0 equals 0, then there's a 50% chance that another randomly sampled point will be above it. This makes sense since z0 equals 0 corresponds to the mean, or the exact middle, of the symmetric distribution. There's a 75% chance that a randomly sampled point will be above a z0 equal to negative 0.6745, a 90% chance for z0 equals negative 1.2816, a 95% chance for z0 equals negative 1.64485, and as z0 becomes smaller and smaller, there's an increasingly high chance that a randomly sampled point will be above it. Our goal in performing this statistical upper subcritical limit analysis is to determine the highest credible k effective or the lowest credible c over e for the operation, or application, that we're trying to design or license. More specifically, we want to determine the 95-95 confidence interval, which is where we have a 95% confidence that there's a 95% probability that this as-built system will have a C over E that's above our confidence interval's limit. If we know that the distribution of C over E's follows a normal distribution with a known mean and a known standard deviation, then we can determine our limit for C over E by taking the mean C over E for the distribution and adding kappa times the standard deviation of the distribution, where kappa is the z-score, or the number of standard deviations from the mean, that corresponds to a p-value of 95% for this single-sided test. As you can see, kappa equals negative 1.64485 here. So through this equation, we arrive at a limit for c over e where there is a 95% probability that another c over e drawn randomly from this distribution will be greater. Now, this limit is not actually a 95-95 limit. 
since a 95-95 limit is where we have 95% confidence that there's a 95% probability that another randomly sampled point will be larger than our limit. The limit here is actually more like a 195 limit, since we assume with 100% confidence that our data points follow a normal distribution with a known mean and standard deviation. In reality, we cannot know the distribution of C over E values for certain, and we must use whatever data points we have available to estimate the normal distribution's mean and variance. No matter how many data points we use to construct the normal distribution of C over E values, there will always be some uncertainty in the distribution's mean and standard deviation. Normal distributions with an experimentally determined mean and standard deviation are actually known as T distributions. The statistical properties of t-distributions were first investigated by William Seeley Gossett, who served as the head brewer at the Guinness Brewery in Ireland. Gossett was studying the chemical properties of barley, and he developed the t-distribution and its related statistical tests to determine if different samples of barley had statistically different properties. Like any good scientist, Gossett wanted to publish his results and to share his knowledge, but he knew that he couldn't publish under his name, or else Guinness's competitors would figure out that Guinness was using the magic of statistics to brew higher quality beer. Instead, Gossett published his work on the t-distribution under the pen name of Student. Thus, these distributions have come to be known as the Student's t-distribution. Using Gossett's work, we can use this equation to determine the kappa value that gives us a 95% confidence that a randomly drawn sample will have a 95% probability of being drawn above our C over E limit, where the T function is the inverse cumulative distribution function for non-central T distributions, where Q equals the desired confidence level, which we assume equals 0.95 here, P equals the desired probability that a new sample will be above our limit, which equals 0.95 here. n is the number of data points used to construct our normal distribution, its mean, and its standard deviation. And z of p is the single-sided z-score for p. The PDF and CDF for a t-distribution are fairly complicated to generate, and they rely on our old mathematical frenemy, the gamma function. Thus, rather than generating the exact t-distribution, Natrella has offered this helpful approximation for estimating the kappa values for a t-distribution, which relies on these constants a and b, which are defined here. Here are several values for kappa, a, and b, as a function of the number of points used to construct the t-distribution for a 95-95 confidence interval. We see that kappa is larger if we have fewer data points with which to construct our normal distribution, and that it approaches negative 1.64485 as our number of data points increases indefinitely. This makes sense. Our normal distribution's mean and standard deviation will contain more uncertainty if we use fewer data points to construct it. And so we'll need to use a larger, more negative value of kappa, since we have less confidence in the mean and standard deviation of this constructed distribution. We gain more certainty in the estimated mean and standard deviation of our distribution as n increases, and as n approaches infinity, we begin to know our distribution exactly, which causes our t-distribution to exactly equal our 100% confidence interval from before and also causes kappa to exactly equal our 100% confidence normal distribution's z-score that correspond to a p-value of 0.95. In other words, if we have an infinite number of data points, then our experimentally constructed t-distribution will actually approach the true normal distribution for the population. This method can reliably produce 95-95 confidence intervals if our data follows a normal distribution, but how can we know if our k-effectives and c over e's are normally distributed? Thankfully, there are several statistical tests that helps us check whether a set of data follows a normal distribution. These tests include the kolmogorov smirnov test, the Shapiro-Wilkes test, and the Anderson-Darling test. So what if we apply these tests and find out that our data is not normally distributed? One alternative is to use a non-parametric method, which does not assume that our data follows any given distribution.
Rather than trying to compute the 95% probability that a C over E will be above some limiting point, another option is to assume that our C over E is bounded by the smallest C over E available in our benchmark data. With enough benchmark data points, this will certainly be true. However, our lowest C over E might not be a reasonable lower limit if we don't have enough benchmark data points, in which case we'll want to subtract some additional margin, delta K NPM, or non-parametric method. So how can we figure out what this delta K should be? And how can we figure out the probability that another randomly sampled point will be above our limiting C over E? Well, given that we have a number of data points equal to N, we can assume that P equals the fraction of data above some value. In other words, P is the probability that a randomly sampled point will be above some value, which we could use as our limit. Thus, P is our probability from before that another randomly drawn point from our distribution will be above our C over E limit, which here we assume to be our minimum C over E. Probability that all n points will be above this limit is actually the confidence that a new point will be greater than our smallest C over E. This confidence equals 1 minus p to the power of n. And given that we want a 95% confidence and a 95% probability, we can solve for the value of n that yields this confidence. This n value equals 59, which means that if we have at least 59 experiments, then we'll have at least a 95% confidence that a randomly sampled C over E has at least a 95% probability of being greater than our minimum C over E value. If we don't have 59 experiments, then we can use this table to determine what additional margin in the form of delta K NPM we should subtract from our minimum C over E prediction. If we have so few points as to have less than a 40% confidence, then we need to find more data points before we can use this non-parametric method. So which of these methods should we use for our 95-95 confidence interval estimates? The non-parametric method is more flexible than the other two methods, but it produces USL estimates that are more conservative. So ideally, we would want to use one of the other methods if possible. We tend not to know the distribution of C over E or K effective values exactly. It tends to be an experimentally determined quantity. So generally this means that we'll have to use the T distribution based USL estimates. However, the one catch with this analysis is that it assumes that all experimental data points are equally valid and that they can be equally weighted when determining the USL. In practice, this will never be true. We'll always have some benchmark experiments that are more or less similar to our target application, and usually we'll need to figure out ways to extrapolate C over E's from integral benchmark experiments to predict the lowest credible C over E for our target application. We'll begin discussing several methods for doing this in the following lectures.